أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وخاتم المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد ولا أهل بيت إيه الطيبين الطاهر المأسمين ولا نتدائم الباقي لعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان صلوات We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity to look at a brief tafsir of Surah Al-Hadid. We have covered about six ayat of the, uh, of the surah. And these were the verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about himself. His power, his glory, uh, the concept of you know, everything in the universe. Uh, glorifying and doing the tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the concept of being Malikul Mulk. And now we reach to the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now talking to us. Even in the earlier ayat, you know, there was message for us, and I would just like to go back to three um, sentences from the earlier ayat. As a response to the question, which was a very, uh, you know, good question last night from a young person, uh, because when we ended the uh, last ayat, it ended with the word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alimun bidhati sudur, that he knows what is in the hearts. And the question was, and when I described it, I said this is the indication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our inner thoughts. Nothing is hidden from him, not only our um, actions, but even what is in our um, minds and hearts. And the question was that, you know, it is the mind which perceives. It is the mind which makes the intentions. So why say hearts? So let me just uh, explain that. Uh, basically, one phrase that we heard from ayat number three, وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended with that, talking about his knowledge, the comprehensive knowledge covering the entire universe. And then at the end of ayat number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ That he is with you wherever you are. وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ And whatever you do, he sees that. And then the last ayat that we discussed last night was, وَهُوَ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ uh, just as a, a point of, you know, um, information for everyone, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the terms like alb or fuad, which means heart, in Quran, these words, in many, many places, they are interchangeable with the word mind or aql. You know, for example, in Surah Muhammad, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, There is an ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do not the people reflect on the Qur'an, ayat of the Qur'an, or is there, they are locks, أَقْفَال um, قُفْل They are locks on their hearts. Now in that, in that ayat, if you see, قُلُوب becomes the point of تَدَبُّر of the Qur'an. It is the hearts which reflect on the ayat of Quran. But here it's not the physical heart that we are talking about. The word qalb and qulub and fuad also, uh, these are used in, in the Quran to reflect, uh, reflecting the, the capacity of uh, you know, thinking and reflecting. And so it is used more in the meaning of aql also. You remember that Quran was sent down to human beings and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the human uh, you know, style of expression. Many times we say, you know, it's in my heart, it's here. Amir al-Mu'minin says to Kumail that, you know, in, in here I have a lot to offer to the ummah, but I don't see the people who are deserving. And so 
you know, we many times indicate towards our heart as the place which contains the secrets of the heart. But it doesn't mean in a physical sense, of course, it is the aql, it is the mind uh, which does the process of thinking, making the intentions, and the issue of intelligence. And the main thing, keep in mind, uh, wherever Allah is, that's why the word basir has come. Because he is with us, he can see us. But then Allah says, don't only think that I can see you uh, from outside. Whatever is even inside you, I am aware, aware of it. Salawat Akbar. Let us move on quick to um, ayat number 7 uh, to 10 for this evening. Uh, this is an ayat which says, آمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا جَعَلَكُمْ مُسْتَخْلِفِينَ فِيهِ فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَأَنْفَقُوا لَهُمْ أَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ Believe in Allah and His Messenger and span out of what He has made you successors of. Those of you who believe and span, for them shall be a great reward. I'll just move through because the ayat are long and we have to keep in mind that we would like to complete the tafsir of this surah uh, by the 15th, uh, by the 14th of, uh, of Ramadan. Um, it's interesting that this is a surah which was revealed in Medina. So the primary audience there are Muslims. Unlike the surahs which were revealed in Mecca, there the primary audience was the mushrikeen non-Muslims. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to the Muslims and what is, what is he saying? He says, آمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا جَعَلَكُمْ مُسْتَخْلَفِينَ فِيهِ There are two commands being given primarily to the Muslims. And I don't want to say that it doesn't, wouldn't apply to others, but the main audience at that time were the Muslims themselves. Those who already believed in Allah and Rasul. And the order here is آمِنُوا Believe. Believe, have iman in Allah and Rasul, you know, what does it mean then? Why, why ask those who are believers to believe? And you will see there are other ayat also of this, this kind uh, where it says, all you who believe, believe. And this is where you come to realize that this is a call not for the initial iman in Islam. This is a call for elevation of our status. Iman has darajat. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is urging the mu'mineen that although you're already mu'mineen, but remember, I would like you to live, to go to a higher level. So, aminu billah wa rasulihi. And what is that, you know, higher level? And that is the level of, you know, uh, commitment. Not just verbal, you know, statement. It is not just the issue of, you know, moving from a nominal mu'min or a Muslim who says the kalima. And we will put there, you know, whenever they fill a form, if it says religion, they will say Islam. And that will be acceptable. Anyone who says, you know, I'm, come, I'm from a Muslim family, or I said the shahadatain, they have a right to write that. But now the issue is that move from that level of the nominal Muslim and mu'min to the level of a true mu'min. And what is the level of the true mu'min? There Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I would like to see action in you. Not just words. Just saying, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah is not enough. I would like to see that you are truly committed to that. And the very first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is asking, as far as demonstration of our commitment, is the issue of infaq. So iman and infaq are coming together. Iman billah, believing in Allah and Rasul, infaq fi sabirillah, to give charity in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where you see that belief and charity, when you put them together, according to this ayat of Quran, it becomes the sign of true iman and true faith. <coughs> then the next sentence, anfiqu, means span. Span from what? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that a human being, you know, we have love for our wealth. So when we are asked to spend, it's not that easy. So now he's trying to explain this whole concept of infaq in a way that it would become easier to give.
to give in charity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the words are, spend out of what he has made you successors of. What does it mean? Mustakhlifeen. Basically what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, you know, you have to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Malikul Mulk. The real ownership and milkiyat only belongs to him. Our milkiyat and our, you know, concept of being Malik of something is etabari. Etabari means Allah has granted us that permission. It is not absolute with us. And with that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there are different ways that I give you the wealth. And one of the most common way is the transferring of wealth from one generation to another. Or from one people to another, either through by the trade or gift or inheritance. And that is why he is saying that wealth is at our disposal by his will. And either we get it by trade or gift or inheritance. And the ayat there, Mimma ja'alakum mustakhlifin. He has made you successors of the generations who came before. So they had wealth, they died, they are no more owners of that. This is where we say this is not real ownership. When a person dies, that's it. It's inherited by others. And so those who become the successors, now they have it. And so we are the successors of the wealth which was there in the previous generation. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that remember, a time will come when you will die also. Others will inherit you. And so the question is, why not use this for your own benefit now in order to build your own akhirah? Because this mal moves from one generation to another, from one person to another, uh, and, you know, it doesn't stay with you. It will not be there in your grave. It will not go with you in the akhirah. The only way you can use it is by building your akhirah, by giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he basically emphasizes this point at the end of this ayat, فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَأَنْفَقُوا And those among you who believe and give in charity, لَهُمْ أَجْرٌ kabir, They will have a great reward. What is that great, great reward will come later on in ayat number 12. Inshallah, we'll look at it tomorrow. And so, iman, you know, with infaq, you know, the, the result would be a great reward. Now, normally, what happens? If you see even this concept of great reward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the ayat of Quran, in surah number 6, he says, مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا Whoever comes with a good deed to me, I'm going to reward him ten, ten times that. So even if you give him, let's say, one dollar in charity, Allah says, I'm going to reward you as if you're given ten dollars. وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ Now we might be concerned. Maybe what's the other side of it? He says, وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ And whoever comes to me with a sin, I'm not going to multiply the punishment there. فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا One sin, one punishment. And so this is a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you do good deed, is going to multiply the reward. If you do a bad deed, he is not going to multiply the punishment. وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And they will not be uh, dealt with unjustly. Now in the month of Ramadan, the number changes. Normally, if you do a good deed, one, ten. In month of Ramadan, you do the same thing. It becomes one multiplied by 70. So if you have any intention of doing good deed, you know, um, and if you've been planning it for maybe a m month from now, you know, utilize the barakat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this month. And so you can get, you know, uh, many, many more times than the reward that you will give, uh, you, you will get during the other months. <coughs> Let's go on to the next ayat now, ayat number 8. وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ يَدْعُوكَ يَدْعُوكُمْ لَتُؤْمِنُوا بِرَبِّكُمْ وَقَدْ أَخَضَ مِثَاقَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ What is the matter with you? The translations are not always the same, but this is the way I would put it. مَا لَكُمْ You know, what is the matter with you? That you do not believe in, in Allah. While you see the messenger is calling you to believe in your Lord. 
And while he has certainly made a covenant with you, if you are truly believers, then you would be, you know, responding to this call of elevating your iman to a higher level. Now let us just look at this. Uh, number one here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the earlier ayat, he talked about two things, iman and infaq. Aminu and anfiqu. Now he is emphasizing this point. He is appealing to the mu'mineen on both points. Number one, the first appeal is about attaining a higher level of iman. And so he says, you know, why not? Why not, especially keeping in mind that the Prophet is there among, from yourselves. You have seen him. You know him. He is a sadiq. He is al amin. You know, he has provided you with a good role model. You know, his akhlaq is akhlaq hasana. That even the pro, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises. And so, if Rasul is there amongst you, and he is calling you to a higher level of iman, why are you not responding? Especially he is not calling to anyone but your Lord, Rabbukum. Bi Rabbikum, your own Lord. He's not somebody else. And this is where we have to realize, you know, the question sometimes comes up about the difference in the darajat of those who believe during the early days and those who believe later on. There's a very interesting conversation where the Prophet asked somebody uh, whose iman would be the best. And he says, well, the malaika. And Rasulullah said, malaika, they are in the proximity of the divinity all the time. They don't have a choice but to believe. You can't expect anything else from them. Then he said, maybe Ambiya. He said, Ambiya, get the revelation from him. They are connected to him. So then he said, maybe us. And Rasul said, but you see me. I am living among you. You see me, you hear me, that I am giving you the message. And that's where Rasulullah says, the quality of the iman of the people who will come later on, who know me without seeing me will be higher than your Iman, because you have seen me. Where those who will come later on will not have seen me. And that's where you will see in one of the du'as that we have for the day of Arafah, our sixth Imam is teaching us to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that oh Allah, I didn't live at a time when the Prophet was there, but I accepted his, uh, the message. Amantu bi rasulik. I accepted your, 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 the message of your Rasul. Therefore, on the day of Qiyamah, do not deprive me to see the blessed face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَقَدْ أَخَضَ مِثَاقَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that there is a covenant between me and you. When you say the kalima, or when you declare yourself to be a Muslim and a mu'min, already there is an agreement that you will be committed to my program. And the program is to believe and go to a higher level where you follow the teachings. And so the kalima here, basically the misaq here, is the kalima itself. Not, it shouldn't just be a verbal uh, declaration, it should be a practical commitment to the kalima. And then, you know, the words end with the question, in kuntum mu'mineen, if you are truly uh, believers, this is what you would be doing. Emphasizing that point, that why do not you believe in Allah and Rasul, and elevate your iman about Allah and Rasul, uh, because look at your Lord, huwa alladhi yunadhilu ala abdihi ayatin bayinat, لَيُخْرِجُكُمْ مِنَ الظُّلَمَاتِ لَلنُّورِ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُمْ لَرَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمِ He is the one who sends down clear verses upon his servants so that he may bring you out of, dark, out of darkness into the light. And verily Allah is kind and merciful to you. Here, basically, it's a continuation of that same appeal to be faithful in our iman to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why? Because number one, he is the one who sent the Qur'an to the Prophet. And what does the Qur'an do? The Qur'an takes us out of dhulamat to the nur. It's interesting that in Arabic the word uh, darkness is in pruler. But I think in English you don't have pruler for darkness. I don't think you can say darkness is. 
because it's just one considered to be, and, th and therefore you'll see many uh, translators uh, use the, the term shed sheds of darkness. Uh, and so when it comes to the wrong ideas and the wrong paths, they can be multiple, but when it comes to the you know, right path, it's only one. So you're a pruler in zulamat, but singular when it comes to nur. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet and the Quran, you know, takes us out of the levels of zulamat and darkness, or shades of darkness, all, all the way to the level of nur. Even in Ayat al-Kursi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu waliyu alladhina amanu yukhrijuhum min al-zulamat ila nur and so keep this in mind that he's the one who is providing this guidance. And so the question is, why would you not believe in him? You know, he's there, he's sent the prophet, he's sent the Quran with very clear uh, message. <clears throat> the next ayat, which... Uh, I think I left the last phrase there. Uh, your Lord is Ra'uf and Rahim. Um, the meaning of Ra'uf and Rahim is very similar, kind and merciful. But Ra'uf is specifically used for the believers. And Rahim is the mercy of Allah, which is universal, covers everyone and everything, even those who do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next uh, ayat, um, ayat number 10. We'll just look at one part of it because the other part is, um, needs more explanation. So we'll deal with that tomorrow, inshallah. This is an ayat, you know, following the same words, Malakum, that why do not you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That was the first appeal of Allah about Iman, wa aminu, and anfiqu was the second command. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying, what is the matter with you that you should not spend in Allah's way? Uh, while to Allah belongs the inheritance of the heavens and the earth. Now this is the second appeal now. The first one is about Iman, the second one is about Infaq. Here the message is very interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you inherited from your forefathers. And Allah will inherit from you. So what is preventing you from doing infaq? What is he saying? Very similar to the earlier ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you are mustakhlafeen. Means you have inherited from people who were before. And then there will be others who will inherit from you. So, you know, keep in mind that this wealth that you have is not going to stay with you. You can't take it with you to the, to the grave. So use it now in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to build your akhirat. Going back to that point, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about even a very further process where he says, you inherited from your, f your forefathers and your children will inherit you. But remember, وَلِلَّهِ مِرَثُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْعَرْزِ Allah will be the inheritor of the entire universe. A day will come when everything will end and there will be no one. And Allah says, I will be the waris. And emphasizing this point that everything actually belongs to me and it will return to me. And as someone who is going to inherit, I am giving you this opportunity. That now that you have it, you know, not as an absolute ownership, as long as you are alive, it is with you. You know, use it. Use it in a way, not only for your dunya, but even for your akhirat. And in akhirat, if we want to use our wealth for it, the only way is what is known as charity and infaq. This concept of, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the waris, uh, it's, it's a very interesting concept in a sense that this is where we see this absolute ownership of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over everything. For us, it is just a point of transition. We, we get things now, we are honor of it now, tomorrow it will pass on to somebody else. But when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is malikul mulk. And he is the waris. Even, and, and this concept of, you know, 
the Malikiyat Haqiqi, the absolute ownership of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is also reflected in our laws of inheritance in our, in our fiqh. For example, you, you know that when a person dies, there are groups and categories of heirs who will inherit after that person dies. Suppose you don't have people from group one, then the second group will in inherit. If there's nobody from class two, then the, those who are from group number three will in inherit. Suppose there is a person who dies and has no one at all. Where you, we use the term la, la waris. There is nobody who will be in his waris and inheritance. What happens to his wealth? I don't think we have ever seen a, a situation, but hyp hypothetically think about it. What happens? According to Shia Fiqh, Al Imam Warisu Man La Waris The Imam of the time becomes the waris of the wealth of a person who didn't have a waris. So when he dies and nobody to inherit him, not even remote relatives, then that becomes the mal of the Imam. He becomes the waris. Why? Because he is the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah is the eventual waris of everything. And so this, this concept of, you know, virasat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a dimension of the malikiyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is malikul mulk. Everything belongs to him. He has allowed us that, yes, you keep things, you, you know, either by working hard by trade or by gift or by inheritance, I allow you to become malik of it. Only temporarily. When you die, even in your, in your own estate, you only have a right to dispose one third according to your own will. The other two thirds you can't touch. That will be distributed according to the laws of inheritance among your heirs. So already you realize when you look at the rules of Inheritance that you, de you don't really have absolute right on what you own. Why? Because it beco belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is being emphasized here. وَمَا لَكُمْ أَن لَا تُنْفِقُوا You know, what is the matter with you? Why would you not spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This doesn't even belong to you. Allah has allowed you to own it. And he says, I am giving you this opportunity to use it to build your akhirah. Because remember, وَلِلَّهِ مِيرَاثُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْعَرْزِ Because the inheritance of the whole universe belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to fulfill our duties, especially during this month of Ramadan, and give us the tawfiq to attain higher levels of iman and be true followers of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad salawatullah alayhi majma'in.